Well, good morning, everybody. Um, hope you're having a nice morning. Hope it's off to a good start. Uh, welcome to the Tribal Wetland Working Group, or as we call it, the TWIGS uh, Wetland Program Development Grant Training. This training is supported by the Snoqualmie Tribes uh, Wetland Program Development Grant from EPA that we're currently working under. Um, so we've got some EPA staff that are going to be uh, kind of mainly heading up the presentation of information today. Um, I'm your host here, and uh, since this is sponsored by the TWIG, the Tribal Wetlands Working Group, um, some of some of the folks that are joining us are from across the country and may not be familiar with what the TWIG is all about. I just want to give a really brief uh, introduction to, to the TWIG. Before I do that, I'll go ahead and um, just briefly go over our agenda for today. So again, I'm Matt Bearwald with Snoqualmie Tribe. Uh, I'm here doing the welcome and, and we'll do just brief introductions from our uh, presenters. I'd, I'd love to get to know everyone that's on the call, but since we have a pretty large group today, I fear that it would eat up too much of our time. So that's why I've asked folks to please just sign in with your name, uh, affiliation, and since we may not know what, what part of the uh, world you're in, uh, go ahead and put a location for us. So after the welcome and introductions, we'll do um, sort of the, a lot of the meat and potatoes of our, of our training today. Uh, Yvonne Vallette, with support from Linda Storm of EPA, are, are going to tell us about grant application elements and examples. And we'll have a, just a short five-minute break. And then Andrea Bennett will um, present on sort of the technical aspects of grant applications, uh, including grant budgets, applications, and management. And then we have at least a half an hour for Q&A. Uh, we're, we're planning on getting out of here at 11.30, but if we have a ton of questions or happen to go just a couple minutes over, we do have a bit of reserve time for um, if folks want to stick around, if we have questions that are still going on at that point. Um, I just want to acknowledge that to everyone that um, this is quite a time of life in the world. There's been a lot of um, dramatic things happening. And, and so I appreciate everyone taking the time out of their busy lives to, to spend some time with us for this wetland program development grant training. And, um, you know, I just want to acknowledge that a lot of us are dealing with many difficult things uh, right now. And, and so it's good that we can be here to support each other. Just a quick reminder of, of best practices uh, for, for WebEx, Zoom, et cetera. Uh, please mute when you're not talking. Um, go ahead and, I've mentioned it many times now, put your name and affiliation and location in the chat bar for us, please. And um, we're going to do questions. We're going to try to hold questions at the end till till the end of the presentations. Um, there, we might have a, a couple of minutes for questions for Yvonne after she finishes her section, but I think the most we, the way our schedule is, we'd, we'd appreciate holding them until the end. If you put them in the chat bar, we'll try to monitor those and get back to them. Um, can we go ahead and, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and just tell you about the, the twigs. The, so the, the Tribal Wetland Working Group is led by a steering committee. Uh, these are the folks that are, are currently on the steering committee. It's Matt Bearwald, myself, Rue Hewitt Hoover with Nez Perce, Scott O'Daniel with Umatilla, Heather Bartlett with Cow Creek, Rudy Salicori at Cowlitz, Tom Elliott with Yakima Nation, and we work closely with uh, Linda Storm from EPA Region 10. Um, can we go ahead, let's do brief introductions from our presenters. Um, Yvonne, would you, can you please introduce yourself? Sure, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I'm Yvonne Vallette. Um, I work with EPA Region 10, been here about 25 years. I was with Region 6 for 10 years before I came out west. Um, and I've been working in the wetlands program and 
particularly on wetland program development grants um, since all of that time. So have a lot of experience. What I do here in the region is I'm the primary lead for what we call the enhancing state and tribal programs um, element. So it's part of the non-regulatory part of our 404 program, but I also work on the technical side, meaning the regulatory side of the program as well. Thanks, Yvonne and Linda. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Linda Storm, and I uh, work with Yvonne Villet in the Wetlands and Oceans uh, program in EPA Region 10, which most of you know who are from this region covers Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. I'm the tribal lead for enhancing state and tribal programs, and I also serve um, as a wetland ecologist and aquatic ecologist in multiple other ways, providing technical assistance to tribes and doing both regulatory and non-regulatory work. And I too have been here for a long, long time. I've got 36 years at EPA and um, 33 of those in the wetlands program as well. So um, I really enjoy working with tribes and um, protecting our resources together. Nice to see everybody today. Thanks, Linda. And Andrea? She may not join us till about oh, 10. That's right. Andrea's not joining us till she, before she presents. And uh, Jimmy, can you say hi? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Jimmy. I'm an environmental consultant working with the Snoqualmie tribe, helping on the background facilitation today for all the technical items. But Great. I will give a Brief introduction for Andrea um, for the benefit. So Andrea is actually one of our most senior um, grant specialists that we have here in our region. So we work very closely with her, not just on uh, wetland program development grants, but uh, in many other grants, including uh, performance partnership grants. So her part of the presentation, like I said, will talk a lot about the inner workings of uh, the grants management. Thank you for that. And then I also just want to acknowledge that um, we've got the, the current uh, TWIG steering committee, which I introduced. I'm currently the lead, but um, we're working on a, a future work plan for the TWIG, hopefully supported by a, another EPA wetland program development grant. And uh, we're working towards transitioning to Kelsey Taylor with Snoqualmie Tribe being the future plan TWIG lead. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So the TWIG is a uh, group of tribes generally from the Pacific Northwest, uh, supported by grants from EPA Region 10, so generally those, those tribes within that geography. And this is just a, sort of an incomplete list of folks that have participated in TWIG events in the past from these tribal organizations. So the TWIG has a mission that we um, collectively decided in 2012. It is the Tribal Wetland Working Group exists to share knowledge and support of the protection and restoration of wetlands and aquatic resources from a tribal perspective. So I think the key, there's a, a few key elements in here. There's sharing knowledge. You know, we do a lot of technical transfer of expertise um, as well as traditional ecological knowledge transfer. Um, and so there's protection and restoration of wetlands, which, you know, answers to a, a, um, often tribal priorities as well as uh, an EPA goal. And then, we, you know, we talk about wetlands and aquatic resources. So the twig is, I think, maybe somewhat unique in that um, we, we make an effort to connect uh, both, you know, physically, culturally, spiritually, uh, wetlands and aquatic resources, where uh, we find that often in, say, state or federal programs, there's a there's a sort of a kind of artificial separation. But um, in a tribal perspective, it's a little easier to see that these things are inextricably linked, and and you know that sort of linkage is already kind of built into many many tribal perspectives. We also outlined our objectives uh, for the TWIG. And so the first one is to promote wetland and aquatic resources training opportunities for tribes, which this event today is answering to. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the other types of trainings that we've been able to offer in the past and the, the kinds of things that we'll 
hopefully be able to consider doing, continue doing in the future. Um, I talked about that share, that knowledge transfer. So we provide a place for information sharing, transfer of technical expertise regarding restoration, protection, and management strategies for wetlands and aquatic resources between staff of Pacific Northwest tribes. So that's, um, you know, we, we, we get together, whether uh, in person or virtually, uh, we have discussions, sometimes focused, sometimes more broad, and um, connections are made. We get to learn what other tribes have been doing, what they're up to, where they'd like to go, and uh, we can provide that kind of support of that network. We support development and implementation of wetland and aquatic resource monitoring strategies. Um, this again kind of goes often ties back to the technical expertise, but you know it, it also connects to our objective number four, which is incre increasing awareness and appreciation of the cultural importance of wetlands and aquatic resources. And that's been uh, something of a recurring theme uh, occasionally for the TWIG is um, highlighting the cultural values uh, associated with wetlands and aquatic resources and um, working collectively, working to um, kind of parse out the, the ways that we can hmm, sort of evaluate cultural values in sort of a Western science perspective and, you know, try to communicate that in a way that can support tribal programs, whether that's through funding or often through funding, frankly. <laughs> For example, through tribal well and program development grants. Um, so the TWIG has historically gotten together in person twice a year. Those were our, were our workshops pre-COVID. We've been, uh, you know, like everyone has have adapted um, to the current situation, so we're we're online for now, uh, which has been great and in enabling increased participation in some sense. Um, so the in-person workshops generally involve content that would be uh, it was organized and presented by the hosting tribes and their collaborators that they would kind of pick um, to highlight with support from from the Twig organization. Um, we would generally kind of spend mornings in a sort of classroom setting and or you know presentations and then field visits in the afternoon generally. Um, sometimes it's you know mostly made up of Pacific Northwest tribes. Uh, occasionally we, we will invite state and federal partners uh, for a, a specific topic or a specific part of a, um, a workshop. And, and I've mentioned this previously, but uh, one of the TWIG's main recurring themes is this sort of emphasis on cultural use of the eco ecological products from water. Um, that may be wetlands or oceans or lakes, reservoirs, rivers, streams, but in particular wetlands. And so, you know, a number of our workshops will have um, re repeating components that deal with first foods and access to those first foods and the physical and ecological processes that support these things. So when we get together for our trainings, this is kind of, a, you know, happy people look like what we look like when we're together. Um, we kind of spread it out, bouncing around the, the Pacific Northwest, um, trying to alternate between east side and west side of the Cascade Range, getting a variety of climates, geographies, uh, geologies, you know, all of those things that are so various in the Pacific Northwest and really drive uh, in the indigenous cultures. One of the things that we did in the past, like, you know, we, we've done some rapid assessment protocols um, a couple of times. One of them was the, the WESP, the Wetland Ecosystem Protocol. Uh, we did this training at Umatilla. We also had a training on the from EPA on the National Wetlands Condition Assessment. And so, you know, this was, I think, a three-day training where there was pretty robust classroom component and then uh, like two days in the field, uh, actually doing plots. 
before I before I go, I just want everyone to know um, you can keep up with everything that the Twig is doing uh, through this website. This is currently the location of the website. Um, we may be moving this in the future to a different sort of platform, but for now, you can you can find us all all our all our work here and next to you know new upcoming events, um, tribal wetland and aquatic resource related opportunities that you know we may not be sponsoring but partners are. Matt and um, Jimmy, will we be able to post all of our presentations on here at least temporarily? Um at we'll at least have a link. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's my email if you want to get in touch with me. Matt B at snoqualmietribe.us. And that's what I have for y'all. So if you're, I, I hope that was um, informative about the twig and not too redundant if you already knew about it. And with that, it's time to go to Yvonne. Yvonne, I think you should be able to present now. Uh, okay, I had to unmute myself first, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> and if you did just join, if you could just type in your name and affiliation in the chat. Uh, that would be much appreciated. Thanks. All right. I take it you can see the slides, everyone? Yep. All right. Well, we're going to be rolling along. I'm going to give you guys a little outline about how I will be presenting the information. First, I thought it was important to talk about competitive grants, what, what's the specifics of them, what makes them a little different than maybe other um, EPA grants that are kind of given, um, you know, so without competition, meaning those are where there's annual awards giving to states or tribes under different um, other program authorities. Like I said, with competitive grants, they are a little bit different and I want you to understand the nuances of it. And then of course, our wetland program development grants as it is competitive grants, we want to talk about the specifics of it as a competitive grant. Then hopefully I will share with you some tips and trips, as I call them, on developing a successful application. Uh, then, like I said, a little later, we have Andrew Bennett, from uh, a grant specialist from our regional office, to talk about a little bit more about some of the specifics that requirements of grant applications. Um, so I do want everyone to understand, though, that federal grant funding is very, very competitive. <laughs> that's why not everybody gets them, and that's why we have the competition. We're looking to award the best of the best, and the reality is, is that each grant cycle, we usually get at least two to three times as much in requests as what we have available to fund. So that means sometimes even a strong application name may not be approved for funding. Um, like I said, but we don't want people to be discouraged. Um, even if you're not successful the first time, we say try again. You just never know where you might be in the queue and what you're in competition with. Or also, if you have the opportunity to get additional feedback on your application, we might be able to figure out better ways to make it stronger. And like I said, with a little bit of effort and persistence, we think eventually you should be able to get your project funded. So here's the basics, though, of competitive grants. So most competitive grant opportunities are announced for at least 45 days. Um, in our EPA regions, depending on the timing, sometimes we, like, uh, such as COVID, for example, knowing that it may be more challenging for, you know, trying to get all the necessary signatures and things like that, we may be able to extend out, you know, to something more like 65 days or something like that. But normally all grant opportunities are at least 45 days. And we also want you to understand that our wetland program development grants, there are two opportunities that are available. There's one at the national level that's open um, to, well, we have the tribal set aside as, as an example at the national level. But there's also, like I said, funding at the regional level. And these are all um, what we call requests for applications. 
Back in 2017, the EPA made the decision that all of our grants, instead of having requests for proposals, we actually have you submit a complete application. The ideal is that it saves us a little bit of time at the front end, but the bad news, it means you have to put a little bit more work, paperwork in particular, in your submissions. But understand that these requests for applications are all published in grants.gov. Um, and so it's known, even though we call it a request for application, it all is lumped in what we call, or what grants.gov calls funding opportunity announcements. So that's where all federal grant opportunities are announced is through grants.gov. So if you're not a regular user of grants.gov, you're wondering, well, how will I know when a grant's out there? Well, what EPA regions tend to do is we send out notifications of these funding opportunities either through direct emails, through our subscriber um, uh, uh, list that we have, newsletters, we use the national website. We, we try to give you as, advanced, as much advanced notice when our grants are coming out as possible. But again, the, the competition for wetland program development grants requires that you have to submit a complete grant application in order to apply. So like I said, in the past, it used to be just a proposal. Here, you've got to do a complete grant application. And everything that is competitive has to be submitted through grants.gov. So the competitive grants all kind of follow a similar format. We have you know, agencies develop criteria, so we have a way to kind of evaluate the proposals against each other, you know, to sort of discern which are, you know, um, are, are the either the best written or meet the criteria, you know, more specifically. But in addition to the criteria, there's a lot of administrative requirements that are spelled out. So again, you have, it's one of those where you have to kind of pay attention. And because it is competitive grants, every agency usually puts together a review panel, and it's usually, there's at least no less than three reviewers um, that are looking at your proposal. So you wanna keep in mind that you may have folks that are looking at your proposal that maybe don't even know anything about your program. So you want to sometimes think about your audience when, when you're writing up your submissions to, you know, be careful use of acronyms and things like that so that things are informative as much as possible and you make an assumption that maybe somebody doesn't know as much as you think they should know <laughs> in reviewing it. Um, these reviewers all each score uh, proposals. It's usually independent. Then, um, you know, like I said, these things are factored in in decision-making by the agencies, but we do want you to understand that sometimes there are other factors that come into play, like how money is distributed over, you know, over a geographic region or to, to certain interests and things like that. Each grant program may vary as how, how those other factors come into play. We'll talk about where, what, what happens in the wetland program development grant and what are those factors that come into play. So let's start a little bit with some of the helpful hints. We know the number one reason why most grant applications are denied is because, you know, you didn't follow directions <laughs> in, in the grant submission. So, you know, what you have, to, so once you've, you have looked at your, your, you're aware of a grant opportunity, what you have to do is look in, that you're interested in applying for, you have to look at the eligibility requirements. Make sure that you're eligible, um, you know, your project is eligible, and you have to make sure you're reading that current request for applications as carefully as possible. There are also very specific deadlines um, that are spelled out. So again, if um, you're thinking of, of applying and you maybe have a specific question, maybe you're not sure whether you're an eligible entity, you have to look at the RFA and look to see who's the contact and when you have to make contact with them to ask your questions. You can't wait till literally the day before an application's due. Um, agencies spell out very specific requirements of who you can make contact with and how you make contact. But like I said, don't hesitate that if you do have questions to, tr you know, to make contact with that, that, that contact person. Um, asking a funder for help it won't hurt your chances of getting a grant. In fact, it's probably the best way to ensure that you're filling out everything in the best way possible. But let's just say you just came, became aware of the, you know, a grant 
opportunity. It's maybe a week left or so. And so that window has passed of being able to make direct contact. What you can do is a, as another resource is look at the agency's website for a link to what we call frequently asked questions. Because more than likely someone has asked that same question. So I know when we put out our regional um, request for application, we try to anticipate or think about all the questions we've been asked and we put an information fact sh sheet out there. So in case you can't get a hold of someone, you have a way to look for, hopefully look for the answer to your question. So I'm gonna go a little bit, we won't go into the details, but every request for application or funding opportunity has has this the same formula that they follow. So you have to figure out how to decipher the information. So the first section is really is just the announcement, it's the description of it, it may include a number. The second part of it has information about how much might be available, um, who are, you know, are these direct awards or are they cooperative agreements? Does it involve the agency's substantial involvement, you know, with these funded projects? Section three is the eligibility. So it describes who's, who's eligible, you know, and what may be some of the requirements in order to receive the federal funds. Section four, though, is, it's very, um, it's the most boring part of most of these requests for applications, but it's very important because it outlines all of the uh, application and submission requirements. It may be everything from how you are supposed to provide your budget, your project description, um, the guidance on the formatting of your submission, the, the page limits, all of these instructions are in this section. And as boring as it is, it's very important though that you, you read these. <laughs> so then um, uh, the other sections are, give you some idea about what's the criteria that we will be, the agency will be using to evaluate and score your applications. Um, section four provides information about um, how will you be notified, what might be some of the um, your reporting requirements if you're successful in getting a grant. And then section seven is the most important part also because if you have a question, who are you gonna call? And so all every request for application or funding opportunity has an agency contact. Then there is the last section that has other extraneous information like and we, again, try to include this within our own wetland program development grants. There may be helpful websites. There may be other example documents that you can use like for budgets and things like that. So agencies try to give, give you as much information as possible to help you in, develop, in drafting up your proposal. They also may have instructions as to what's allowed for attachment. So what counts as an attachment versus what counts as your page limit. So those are all things that you have to pay attention. So like I said, the key, the key things to note in a request for application is first, be aware of what's your deadline. <laughs> um, when, it, when, when, it, when is that application required to, to, you know, to be submitted? And you wanna work backwards from there. You also wanna note the page restrictions. You have to also figure out what's allowable and not allowable. So for example, in our wetland program development grants, we can pay for certain planning activities, but we can't pay for you know, the direct implementation of, of wetland programs. So again, that's why you have to be very careful how you construe your, in your project and description of your activities. You need to look again at the submission requirements and build in time because all of that has to go into grants.gov. Which means you need to make sure that person, if it's not you that has an account with grants.gov and there's someone else in your agency that is the designated person for grants.gov submissions, that they're available the time you need them to be to submit that application on time. And then another, um, I think, important part is to look at the scoring criteria. You will, every criteria has a variety of points asso associated with it. So you wanna note the criteria that will, may affect your scoring the most, because that really can help you to guide where you put your emphasis in putting together your, your application. But again, you have to decide, are you gonna, you know, you, you're sitting here and you're, you know, thinking, hmm, I might wanna apply for this, but again, before you make that decision, because it, there is a lot of time that it takes many hours to put these applications and these proposals together. So again, 
you have to answer yes to see to these questions, meaning have I read the request for application or the funding opportunity completely, and do I understand it? And is my organization um, eligible to apply based on the eligibility criteria that's described? And does my agency even have the technical expertise, you know, um, the, the program and financial capacity to be successful implementing this, this project? And does my mission, my organization's mission align with the same goals that are outlined in the agency's request for application? And the other thing is all the, uh, all the stakeholders and the leaders in my organization, will they support? Because there may be financial obligations associated with match, meaning if you're successful in getting this award, they need to know they may have to pony up some money <laughs> um, as match. And then again, is my organization prepared to do what it takes to successfully implement that project within the budget that you've proposed? So you have to think about, well, what are the administrative requirements that come with federal funding, such as the match, reporting, auditing, fiscal management, and providing outreach and technical transfer, things like that. So those are all things you have to be prepared to answer yes before you decide, I'm going to go ahead and apply for this grant. So we'll talk a little bit about the specifics of, well, okay, I've, I've made a decision, yes, so now I'm trying to prepare my application. Well, the key part of the application, in addition to all the paperwork and you know forms and things like that, is writing a strong proposal. So what you have to be prepared to do is have your specific project goals and objectives clearly defined. And that means you include, you know, um, making sure that the need for the activities you've outlined in the grant support your are well supported by your agents your organization's track record meaning you know i work in, in you know in a water protection program um, for my tribe so yeah it's it's definitely a you know a good alignment our our program's goals and objectives are you know to protect and, and restore so you know that's that's should be easy to articulate but you also want to show how you plan to achieve the purposes of the grant program. And if you have supporting information or data, which means it could even be from past grants, where maybe the, your grant proposal is building on past efforts, describe that. But you also have to describe the knowledge, staffing, and fiscal capability the organization has to be able to you know, successfully carry out the, propo the proposed project, as well as meeting the goals of, our, of the grant program. And then the hardest part is sometimes is developing a budget using a realistic plan that allow, you know, that aligns to the goals and objectives, which means you need to also consider having some kind of a narrative that justifies the cost. So let's say you're, you anticipate in your budget having to do X number of site visits. Well, explain why do you need that many site visits and what's, what are the costs associated? Are you driving? Are you flying? Using a boat? Things like that. But most importantly, you want to be concise and precise in describing your grant activities. Because at the end of the day, you still have to adhere to the page limits that are specified in that request for applications. So uh, again, the project narrative is one of the most important parts of your grant application. So what you want to, you want to use it as an opportunity to tell not just the agency which might be the decision maker, but also the reviewers, your story. How you've got to use your data and words to paint a picture of how your program and your community will benefit from the outcomes of this project. You also want to support your narrative with specific information about how you plan to achieve your project outcomes. So that's why we, you know, we require, you know, a project timeline that shows like milestones, that schedule, you know, with the outline specific tasks and subtasks, and then it has to be supported with a detailed budget. And before you turn in your application, it's always a good idea to maybe have a few other folks review it. Because it's really surprising how easily you can skip over the easiest grammatic spelling or even um, or accounting errors. So again, it's always great to have a couple of eyes 
you know, on your proposal before you, you, you submit it. So submissions, like I said, go through grants.gov. Well, what's involved with that? Well, first, you have to have a registered account to use grants.gov. So don't think that the day before the grants due that you're just going to sign up into grants.gov. It, it can sometimes take anywhere from three to five business days to receive access um, once you register for an account. So that's why it's important when you, like I said, be very, very timely. And the other thing is once you complete your application, including all the forms, what you want to do is make sure you save it on your computer so you have a backup. <laughs> so, but there are, the great, the, one of the great things though about grants.gov is that it is, while it's an automated system, it does have some built-in um, um, audit functions so that if you have paperwork that's missing, it will let you know which is why it has a check for errors. So if you're missing a particular form that's required, the the system will let you know that that's, that that's missing. So again, but the one um, difficulty or, or I would say caveat with uh, grants.gov is that once you save and submit, um, that submission, does, the system doesn't allow you to go in and, and, and change things. So again, you have to make sure that you've got all, the, all your ducks in a row, all your paper work ready to download and put into the system. Now, how you, now you're wondering, it's like, okay, now I just put everything into a black box. How do I know it's really there? Well, the good thing about grants.gov is that it will give you a series of emails to let you know meaning it, particularly if you've started an application but haven't completed it, it'll help you keep track of what's happening with your application, whether you're still in a draft stage versus a final stage or whether, um, again, your application's been received for the agency. So you wanna keep those emails because that could be your track record in case there is a problem down the road. But as I said, there are some, um, caveats uh, with regard to grants.gov because again once you make a submission you can't make edits or append any documents you can resubmit your application in order to make those corrections but again once you hit send it's it's there which is why you should make every effort though to submit your application about 48 to 72 hours in case you just thought you know what I forgot to include this little narrative here that I think is really going to make the difference. You know, so you again, you want to give yourself plenty of time if you have to go back in and redo something and resubmit that you've done that. Again, it's really important because the system won't check for spelling and it won't correct your, your you know, your, your calculations or your budget or your, or your page limits. Um, so again, you still have to be responsible for, for checking those things before you submit. So one way you can do that is again, you can use a checklist. Most of um, uh, funding opportunities um, have a checklist um, associated with them. So that, you know, again, before you submit it, you make sure that you've got all those documentations or you can create your own. But again, um, you have to be careful too that some applications require a specific order for their document, the documentation. So you just want to check to make sure that, you know, oh, I, I put my budget here after my project description versus I should have put it before the description of, um, you know, staff capabilities. Again, make sure that you've dressed all of the criteria that's going to be used to score your application because you don't want to leave any points um, on, the, on the table. Okay, so let's just presume you've submitted your application and now you're wondering, well, what happens now? What, what happens next? Well, um, again, every grant eligible grant application, which means you've met at least the sc screening criteria to be moved forward and not be um, removed from the, the system because of either administrative error or an incomplete application. If you got a complete application and you're considered eligible, then basically it's, it moves on to what we call um, a review panel. 
And so every application is reviewed by at least um, three reviewers who, you know, separately score it. Um, and this, this panel is usually, we have a, a, a moderator who oversees it. We all fill out, you know, um, uh, conflict of interest forms and things like that to make sure, again, that we don't have any bias in the process. And after those applications review, typically reviewers usually will come together, although these days it's remotely, to discuss the various strengths and weaknesses of each application and try to arrive kind of at a consensus score or at least a our decision to move for, to allow an application to move forward for funding consideration or not. And again, as what the panel does is we summarize all of our, our findings and then we present that to basically, you know, the, who is, whoever is the grant official for that particular grant. So that's the basics of, um, of what a, um, a competitive grant process looks like. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about wetland program development grants. But first, I just wanted to give you guys all at least a visual reprieve from all those tech slides, <laughs> if only for a second or two. Where is that, Yvonne? It's beautiful. Um, that is actually uh, Willapa Bay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so moving on. So we, like I said, now that we've talked the general specifics, we're going to talk about what makes uh, what program development grants a little different? What, what's the nuances of those? Since that's why most of you here are on this call is to learn about, about that. Well, wetland program development grants are two to five year grants that are awarded to states, tribes, and local governments. Um, at the national level, um, these grants also, uh, well, they can also be used by um, interstate agencies and intertribal consortium. But basically what they're meant to do is provide opportunities to refine um, or develop, um, you know, comprehensive state, tribal, and local governments. And what we try to do is use these grant dollars to basically build the capacity, you know, of either state, tribal, or local governments that hopefully will lead to increasing the quantity and quality of wetlands in the U.S. Although we put a lot of emphasis on wetlands, but the reality is we're talking about all aquatic ecosystems. We don't think wetlands are the most, you know, the only and above all, um, you know, aquatic resource worthy of consideration. Um, even though, like I said, back in the, or in the late 80s, that's kind of what the 404 program focused on was, was on wetlands, but the reality is this program is much more comprehensive than that. So, don't be swayed by the ideal that it only addresses wetlands. But the background of our wetland program development grants is what we call the core elements framework. And I'll go a little bit about uh, more specifics about that. But basically um, in our request for application, we basically require that projects that are proposed have to address what we consider one or more of the four core elements. So this core element framework, um, we've, it's been in existence since the early, yeah, 2000s or so, 2007. Um, it's basically a found, what we now consider to be the foundation for our, well, our enhancing state and tribal programs, but also the foundation for wetland program development grants. Um, so what we have done is in developing this core elements framework, we've tried to distill a set of core elements, actions, and activities that we think compre comprise a comprehensive program for states, tribes, or local governments. So what we've done is we've just, we've identified four core elements that we think make up an effective program. And those are efforts or elements are around monitoring and assessment, voluntary restoration and protection, regulatory approaches, which also includes the 401 certification um, aspects, and then development of water of wetland specific water quality standards. Although I think these days we're basically acknowledging um, it, that certainly it can be beyond just wetlands. Though many states and tribes that have been working a lot on water quality standards typically already have surface water standards developed. 
Wetlands, is, as we know, has always been a little more challenging to develop standards. But we also um, give some emphasis or try to tie in um, our wetland program development grants to wetland program plans. So what you may notice is that headquarters um, and, and the EPA regions will distinguish in their request for applications that, P, that applicants submit um, their proposals for consideration of either a tier one or a tier two category. Tom Curley, I think I need you to have you on mute because that's where I'm getting feedback. <laughs> but um, tier one is proposals that include basically the development or refinement of activities that are already included in EPA uh, approved wetland program plan. So like I said, what what EPA regions, many regions have done, including EPA, we made decisions to set aside a greater portion of our available um, wetland program development grant funding allocations to support projects that would fit into tier one, meaning, again, they help to move forward activities that are identified in wetland program plan. And then we put a lesser amount towards tier two, which means these are proposals that are not related to a wetland program plan, but they still address at least one of the core elements. So, and again, in your submissions, you are asked to in, you know, in your submission to indicate whether you want to be considered either for tier one or tier two review. So it's something to just be aware of is like I said, a nuance in our wetland program plan or in our wetland program development grants. Um, so you're wondering, I'm just giving, this is just a very simple example. Uh, what many uh, applicants wind up doing is maybe at the beginning of their proposal is just creating a very brief narrative or a summary. And what they do is outline their project title and identify again, track one or track two. And then they identify what are the core elements that in their project proposal that they are they are, think they're addressing. So it can be very short and sweet and that's all we ask you to do. Now, um, like I said, every competitive grant has um, review criteria and we're gonna go over some of the specifics and how we how you might be able to navigate that in your project proposals to try to maximize the number of points that are available in each of these criteria. So for example, project need, this is a, a meaty one because again, it's worth 15 points. This lays the foundation of the rest of your, of your proposal. So it's, you know, what we ask you to do is maybe give us a, just, you know, a narrative about what are the threats, you know, um, or impairments to your, your particular um, aquatic resources. And what is the need for the actions that you're proposing in your, in your project? And how will those specific deliverables um, lead to some kind of an increase either in the quality or the quantity of those resources? And what's helpful is sometimes giving us an idea about, you know, your geographic area. What are the specific issues or wetland types or impairments you know, that are maybe unique and what are those adverse issues that your resources are facing and that this project might helpfully address. And again, you have to identify the core element or, you know, elements that you're specifically trying to use in your application. So another unique um, aspect of Wetland Program Development Grants is what we call regional priorities. Um, sometimes it may be identified as a regional priority or it may be a national priority. Um, that is region specific, but some examples of, of regional priorities that EPA has identified have been related to climate change, such as sea level rise, increased flooding, environmental justice issues. We may also um, decide that there's you know, specific resources. So here in the West, we've had sometimes in the past put 
specific emphasis on either, you know, approaches that look at the consideration of protection or assessment of like vernal pools. And or maybe we've also placed some emphasis on development of regional assessment tools for aquatic resources. So again, even though it's only five points, those can be five, those five points can make or break, you know, whether your project gets funded or not. Um, then uh, another, again, it's worth 15 points, so pretty important, is your project tasks. Um, so this is where you have to tell us how you're going to accomplish your project. So you want to try to describe all the um, project tasks or components, as well as the anticipated products or outputs with each task, and who's going to be doing it. Is it your within your organization? Are you be working with maybe other partners? And if you're developing uh, development of a methodology as part of it, you have to again outline all those development steps that are needed in order to you you know develop and use a method. Um, milestones is another important one. So it's um, we want to, you know we we ask you to kind of give us an idea. Is this a is this a year long project? Is this a a three year project? Um, will this take multiple you know field seasons um, to accomplish the work? So you have to break out your tasks either into phases, you know, um, with specific outcomes and outputs. And also, it's helpful to include what are your dates. So are you doing this in, in year one, year two, uh, first quarter of the year, second quarter? And then you also want to um, maybe identify milestone dates in which you're going to actually like complete that component. So as we know, many steps um, build upon one another. So maybe you, again, have to do field work before then you can do um, some of your analytical work that can then be used to develop, you know, some kind of a applied methodology. And most importantly, though, you want to make sure, though, you've outlined a schedule that makes sure that you can use your awards, you know, your awarded funds in a timely and efficient manner. So again, there's a variety of uh, trying to give examples. Um, this is one where um, They've actually, this applicant actually um, was able to save, a, I would say, a lot of paperwork by um, one, they've used a template that actually outlines all their, their project objectives, their tasks, their outputs, and their schedule. They've put it all side by side. Like I said, there's a lot of choices. Um, you can do this either narratively or you can do it, again, using... Um, you know, different tools, Excel or graphs, things like that. But there's a lot of ways that you can provide concise but yet informative information. Budget, um, it's only worth five points, but this is one where we often find um, we, sometimes there's not a lot of information provided on to justify a budget that can, you know, um, give a low score. So what you have to do is make sure you, try, and that's why it's important to, to talk to maybe someone in your department or your organization that has experience with budget, meaning how do you cost this out? How do you figure out, you know, um, how to account for how much personnel or travel? Because you have to try to put that in. You have to at least put a description of what it is. You also have to consider if there's going to be any um, non-federal partners that will contribute to this that might go um, count towards your, your cost share of the match. Um, you also have to provide, though, it's not enough to put numbers down. You kind of have to justify it with a narrative description. And then we have to be able, you have to provide enough information to determine whether those costs for each task and component are reasonable and allowable, including your use of your your, your any cost share or match. So if you're saying that you're going to, you're budgeting $3,000 to go to conferences, we have to have, provide us enough information to know that attendance to this conference is somehow germane or relevant to the project that you're doing. Maybe it's what you're attending that conference in order to provide some tech transfer of some of your, um, your project um, outcomes. 
So again, a budget can be relatively simple. You break it out by task with a description and an output. Uh, so again, there's a variety of ways to um, consolidate and still accurately capture a lot of relevant information. Transfer results. For us, this is a biggie. We really, the, you know, what we always see is one of the benefits of the wetland program development grant is for, and because it's focused on program development, we hope that the successes of particular states and tribes can be transferable to to other um, other parts of the of the of the war of the uh, the U.S. or to other parts of the country or to other similar state or tribal um, organizations. Because if somebody doesn't know about your project, then you know how can, how can they capitalize on it? So we ask you, and this is worth ten points, is to tell us the ways you'll be sharing information. Maybe it's giving presentations at different forums um, that you're already part of. It could even be submitting even um, like raw data or refined data back to the um, as part of the National Wetland Inventory um, into their uh, public data uh, platform. You could present a webinar to other, you know, um, conferences or organizations such as this, or you can even share the sites, you know, your results on a website or on other organizations' websites to, you know, showcase your project. So these are the things we look for is to try to see if there's opportunities to maximize, you know, the outcomes and benefits of your project that it can pave the way for other organizations. Environmental results. This is always the, um, I would say, one of the more challenging ones. But I would say in particular EPA and our request for applications, we we try to guide you through this. We, we provide links to what our most current um, strategic plan is. You know, even though we ask you to talk about how your particular project will meet the, you know, um, will conform to our strategic plan, you know, what, and so we ask you what are your project outcomes and outputs, so, and how that meshes together. Um, many of you who do other grant programs know that there is sort of a logic model that comes um, in putting together, you know, grant proposals, meaning their outputs are considered products and deliverable. So, you know, we just say, tell us, what do you think is going to happen at the end of this project? What are your outcomes um, or specific, tangible um, products? And then what are the outcomes are more of those long-term, you know, maybe certainly less tangible, but where do you hope to make improvement? Is it in behavior, you know, with a regulated audience? Is it the knowledge base of a certain community? Those are all things that we ask for. So this is an example of, again, where someone, again, in a narrative form said, you know, describe what is our, our current uh, strategic plan and our strategic plans do um, change every couple of years. So it's while you look to the request for application, make sure you have the, the most current plan <laughs> that EPA is operating under. And then, like I said, you try to provide a short, succinct linkage to how your project relates to that specific goal or objective under our plan. Um, I give an example here of a case of a, of a state program where they are proposing to do um, uh, instructional videos um, to contractors about their program. So again, for an output, they're basically saying is, um, you know, we're, it's going to provide better education. And so we hope to have you know, a better program because there's more information. In addition, they're also saying, well, we're also going to do a final report that will look at the effectiveness of the training that we offered by looking at who, you know, who has taken the training and if they are more likely to be following all the conditions of our 401 certification. And then as an outcome, they're saying, what we hope to do is 
the, the bigger picture is to change behavior, meaning that people understand the requirements of our program and see why it's important to follow the rules and regulations to protect waters. And then um, there's criteria, there's the programmatic capabilities and technical qualifications. So basically in the, in, for, the, you know, for this criteria, what we're asking you to do is to provide a description of your organization's experience. So maybe again, you are a, um, um, a water quality organization is your primary mission. And so again, it's well, uh, well equipped and well adapted and aligned in order to implement this project because you've already got resources, you've already got you know, um, people who are knowledgeable in this area to be able to successfully implement the project. So again, we asked for a, you know, a key, uh, a list of the key staff, what some of their relevant experience and backgrounds are. And then again, if you don't have it and you're hoping maybe through the grant to maybe obtain it through other means such as contracting or hiring, you have to describe at least some ideal of what level of expertise you'd be looking for to fill in those knowledge bases. Um, partnerships is also very important. Um, and those partnerships could be not just external, but they also could be a partnership maybe with a sister department. So maybe you are a water quality um, organization um, or, or office. Maybe this is an opportunity to do some partnership maybe with the fish and wildlife folks. So again, we're not saying it's required, but we do look to see if there's opportunities to make this the the results of your project and the outcomes may be more transferable and even more relevant to more than one use. So we definitely look for partnerships. Um, and maybe you're in the process of like, you don't have a partner, but you're hoping to have some additional partners because one, you haven't gotten the grant yet. At the very least, describe how you plan to engage them and what would be their relationship in completing the project. Um, then our, that we have past performance. So this one, um, what, oops. Uh, what we ask you to do is to maybe just briefly describe past either federal or non-federal um, agreements that you've had that may be similar in scope. So let's say you're asking for 250,000, you know, um, maybe, you know, but maybe you've only had a couple of like 50,000. It may not be exactly uh, the same, but you know, if you have, if you at least have some experience with previous grants, I would, you know, tr go ahead and try to describe them. But we ask you to include no more than five agreements, even though we ask that they're all preferably EPA agreements, but we know that's not always possible. And again, we just ask you to provide a brief history. Were you able, you were successful in, in you know, completing and successfully managing those agreements? Um, and then, or if there were problems, you know, how, were you able to be successful in addressing them? But again, as you see, I have a caveat that maybe you don't have any past grants or reporting information to provide. What we ask is at least indicate that you don't have it so you don't receive a zero score. At the very least, you still can receive at least a neutral score, which we consider to be four. So again, these are why well, it's always important to read the RFAs to figure out these nuances because yeah, you'd hate to lose eight points <laughs> for nothing. Um, I wanna tell you guys that um, uh, there is a potential resource that's out there that EPA has, meaning if this is your first foray into developing a wetland program development grant proposal, that we do have this great informational database that has all of the grants that have been awarded since the 1990s. It's accessible to the general public, um, but it has a lot of great data in there that you can use, um, including a number of case study narratives and model products that have been developed by states and tribes through the Wetland Program Development Grant. So meaning if you're not sure, meaning maybe you're wanting to develop a monitoring and assessment project and really not sure, you know, what scale and scope should it be, um, you can look here for some potential examples of previously awarded 
just to see what maybe how did how did the other applicants um, because these were successful applicants how did they describe their project designs and deliverables so you can find additional information you may not find the specific work plan but you can still find a lot you might even find a point of contact that you can use to call to say hey um, you guys you know we're successful in a grant doing this and we're thinking of something similar can you share information with us so i just want you guys to know that this is a little hidden jewel of information and like i said it is um publicly accessible to everybody um if you don't already know it you can uh, you can just do a google search and you can find wetland grants database and boom pops up okay another visual break <laughs> for ya. Now, some of you, particularly for tribes and a few states, wondering, well, how do performance partnership grants, um, PPGs fit in? Can I, how do they fit in with uh, wetland program development grants? Well, I can tell you that yes, wetland program development grants can be added to existing or new wetland program um, performance, performance ship grants. Um, there are some nuances, and actually Andrea is going to be talking about some of those a little bit more. But again, important uh, consideration when you're developing your application is the match. Even though you might, you have to indicate to us one that you are anticipating of adding this to a performance partnership grant. In which case, you have to consider whether you'll your your uh, your tribe in particular is eligible to be you know, have a reduced match requirement or not and so again you have to indicate in your submission if you anticipate if it's funded including it into an existing ppg or whether you intend to create a new ppg that would include this wetland um, project or not so again you've gone through the hurdle and you've got the submission in and you're wondering well again how's epa making decisions well, in our particular region um, and, and many other regions, we look again at where's the geographic distribution of those funds going. So if we, we've got four states, but we got 271 tribes, we can't, we, you know, we look at whether, you know, are we at least getting some, you know, some geographic diversity, you know, of, of, of those funds between, you know, Alaska, Idaho, and Oregon, and Washington, as well as the tribes that are there. We also look at diversity of projects. So maybe we have two monitoring assessment projects, but one is stronger because it advances, you know, the program or takes a novel approach. So we may elect to, you know, to fund that only one of those projects. The other thing is that while we may have announced that maybe we had a million and a half, we only get like 1.2 million. And so we have to make sometimes some hard decisions. And we also look at the distribution of awards that you know happen between track and tr track one and track two. Like I said, we typically set aside 60% for track one projects that are supporting wetland program plans versus 40% that go to track two. And again, we also look at whether there may be a similarity of your project to other projects that may be funded by other EPA programs. So again, maybe again Same you have I've never said. you have a project that's you know um, related to to um, you know water quality development and maybe we we feel it's better supported through your 106 funds rather than the uh, 404b1 funds. Um, so typically, grant decisions are made within three to six months. We always try thrive for three months because we don't want to leave folks hanging. We know you want to get your money because you're probably putting your, you know, you submit like in February or March and you're thinking you're going to get out in the field that year. And if you don't hear back for six months, you've missed a whole, you know, year of, of, of field work. So we try to do it sooner rather than later. And then if you do get notice of funding, we there, be aware that may be additional requests for modifications. So we may have to do some fine tuning or clarification um, on your budget or your work plan. Or there's also the potential that you, you know, because we have less fun, funding available um, and we can only partially fund um, part of your request. So you may be offered less money. But also understand if you are turned down, 
take the opportunity to to, to request feedback. So um, in our in our grants process, we have a point of contact that that again um, that you can contact, and you will be always offered the opportunity to to you know to get a um, basically a uh, a debrief. Take advantage of that. Just figure out why your application was turned down, and what you can do to strengthen you know what might be a future submission. Also, you know, again, if it maybe just it wasn't ripe or the timing wasn't right, we may ask you to just consider applying for the next grant cycle. But whatever, however it goes, we think it's always a good idea to open up the lines of communication with any possible funder, whether it's EPA or someone else. Okay, now here's the trips. This is the, based on lessons learned. Um, these are real, <laughs> every one of these. Um, of why grants haven't been funded in the past. So we often have people that are, are entities that will recycle an old grant proposal without bothering to update it. So let's say, um, you know, the, the, this is 2021 and you're submitting, submitting an application and it shows all this work being done in 20, 2018. Eh, not a good idea. Um, another common mistake is not addressing the required 25%. So you felt uh, some proposals only focus on the federal and forget to identify where that match is coming from. Or they may include ineligible costs. So they may think, oh, wow, we've needed this. We've needed a new field rig. So we're going to use half of this money, you know, to purchase a vehicle. No, nope, not eligible. So. And then another common one is exceeding the page limit. That requirement is real, so you have to pay attention to it. You don't want to be that that situation or that circumstance where, again, because you didn't read the directions, you, you submitted too many pages, you got excluded. Um, another common reason is that again, there wasn't clear information on what the budget expense is for, um, whether it was for staff or for equipment or things like that, and how all that would be used. Another real situation is sometimes not getting prior approval from your either leadership or tribal council prior to submitting your application. Because understanding that if you were to receive an award, there may be a required financial commitment for the match that they may they need to have been aware of. The other thing is that sometimes, well, often, again, we have many folks that miss the submission due date. <laughs> They were a day late or they were an hour late. It didn't, it doesn't matter, but you know, the timeline is the timeline. And then the most common is to, but which is less so these days because of submissions through grant.gov is missing some kind of a form. And then a short word on managing your grant. So let's say you have been lucky to receive your award. So now it's time to put it to use. So what we ask you to do is make sure you look at all the instructions that are given to you um, in, you know, with regard to reporting uh, requirements. I mean, all of those instructions are usually sent when the grant's awarded. So there may be terms and conditions that you need to be aware of. So you may also have in your, in your um, work plan said that made a commitment that you're going to prepare a quality assurance plan for your project before you begin your project. Make sure you do that. You don't want to be in violation of your permit, I mean, of your uh, project or grant terms and condition. You also have to be prepared for all future audits and reporting. So it's always best to keep yourself um, well organized um, by keeping all of your grant materials in an accessible folder, whether it's a physical folder or an electronic folder, but it could be copies of receipts, reports, all basically confirming that you are somehow in compliance with your, you know, post award management instructions. So, and paperwork is important even after the award. And like I said, EPA does require reporting. It could be maybe twice a year. It could be annual. It depends on the type of project and the entity. Um, we have several templates that we can share with people to see that can be used or replicated to help facilitate that grant reporting. It doesn't have, um, what we find is many 
grantees start off with sort of a narrative and then they keep adding on as they move through their project. So like I said, we try to make it as easy as possible. But you also have to remember that, you know, many of these grants are, you know, more than a year. So you have to remember, you can't just report on, on the first year. We have to have reports done over the life of your agreement. And if there are issues or delay, there's, you have a point of contact. You have your project officer. There are ways to, to, to you know, to address those issues or, or delays, whether you need, a, you know, an extension on your grant or you've lost a, a, you know, valuable staff member. We can figure out ways to help you be successful in implementing your project. And I am done. <laughs> that was great, Yvonne. Um. <laughs> And good to good to get the sort of inside scoop on uh, EPA's thinking and what you're looking for and sort of some of the funding decisions. Um, there are a couple of questions uh, rolling in via mm -hmm. chat, and then we might have time to get to those before the break. But Linda also wanted to um, add a couple of thoughts, and I thought that it would be you know yeah. it would be great to keep that in this section. Um, what what were you thinking, Linda? Hey, Yvonne, that was that was excellent. Thank you. Um, so just just pinging on a couple of p uh, key points from my experience in terms of what Yvonne has covered that I wanted to articulate and sort of highlight. Um, so key areas that I see um, trips for wetland applications, um, either in the national travel set aside process, which I'm the regional lead for and work with Myra Price um, on and other regions on, which is a specific tribal only application process for wetland program development grants, which many of you are familiar with and have some of you have received awards either there or through the region 10's request for applications process, which Yvonne was specifically emphasizing. In either place, um, key areas to be sure that you provide details include um, on the project need, one of the criterion that um, in, as reviewers, we have to check the box is that the project will increase um, either the acreage or the functions of wetlands and aquatic resources. So that's something that may not always be the case with your project, but just know that that's something that is the language in that rank, rating and ranking in terms of meeting those 15 points. And then for the other big one, um, project tasks, in that area, a nuance that um, I wanted to highlight was that in, in our review criteria for that one, it also says we want to see what the methods and, and or approaches are going to be for you to achieve and accomplish the outcomes and the outputs. Um, so it's really, and even though outcomes and outputs is addressed in a later section under environmental outcomes, it's really important for um, you to articulate what your methods or approaches will be. And that's the section where you wanna highlight that is in the project task that's I think worth actually 20 points. Um, and then the uh, third thing is on the milestone schedule, Yvonne provided an excellent example of that. Um, it's really important in that schedule to have an explicit start and end date for each of your tasks and subtasks. And that's something where some folks um, kind of miss that. And it, it's a little nitpick thing, but it can actually make a difference in terms of points. Um, so looking at those examples of milestone schedules that provide in a very succinct and like one page way, the details that summarizes what you've said previously in your work plan is super helpful. Um, and then lastly, um, and importantly, key uh, area that I see a lot of trips is the budget. Um, it's the, the applications require a detailed narrative budget in the proposal. Um, and then there's also what's called the SF-424 forms. Um, an area that people often trip is um, a disconnect between the form and what's reported there and what you say in your narrative. So make sure those things are consistent and clear. And then also, as Yvonne was saying, um, you need to break down what we call the object class. So for personnel, 
for example, we want to see it broken down and there's different ways to do that, but you know, the who's going to do what for how much, um, what is the hourly wage, how many hours and how many personnel is a very helpful way to break that down. Um, and then for travel, it's the other area that people kind of miss sometimes. You need to break travel down into the specifics. How many trips, even if it's just an estimate, how much for, for gas, you know, how much for accommodations or lodging, that needs to be specifically broken down. That's often a place where our grant specialists will kick them back. So just wanted to give you some additional in the weeds kind of perspective there. And then um, the last thing I put in the chat was, um, if you've received um, a, a no for a grant that you've applied for before, or if it happens again, there are always points of contacts to reach out to from the RFA um, to schedule a follow-up debriefing meeting. And um, I put it in the chat that Krista Ray Perkins is our current Region 10 um, contact, and I think she will be this next round. And then. Myra Price at EPA headquarters is the contact for the national travel set asides. And she works with each of the regional reps to schedule a meeting whereby we can be there too, so that we can provide you that technical support that you may need um, in moving forward in your next application. And we won't be telling you what the points were that you received, but we will be giving you constructive feedback on some weaknesses and areas of improvement. So I just wanted to say that. 